Okay, so officially I'd like to welcome you here today uh, to our Lunch in the Garden webinar. Uh, my name is David Shinnery. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension and I'm awfully glad to have a nice audience here today uh, to talk about the basics of seed starting indoors, uh, annuals and vegetables. We're going to really talk about some of the easier things to grow from seed. We're not going to talk about some of the more difficult things like perennials or woody plants. That may be another program coming up uh, in the future. So today we're going to talk mostly about annuals and vegetables. A lot of folks probably have done this already, so this may be a review. Um, if you have questions as we go along, type them in the chat box and we'll answer the questions at the end and uh, see if we can uh, make some sense of all those kind of things. So I do appreciate you being here and let's get started. So why bother with seeds? Well, that's a good question. One of the things I've been thinking about is seeds offer promise. And I was reading a wonderful book called The Well Garden Mind by Sue Stewart Smith. And in that book, she says, gardening is more accessible than any other creative endeavor, such as painting or music, because you are halfway there before you start. The seed has all its potential within it. The gardener simply helps unlock it. So yeah, we can create beautiful pictures. We can create a lovely environment with seeds. And really, we're just kind of facilitating the process because the seeds are doing a lot of the work. Um, so that's one of the wonderful things about gardening. You can be uh, not a virtuoso gardener and still have a beautiful garden, I think. Does growing plants from seeds offer something from the spiritual dimension? I think so. And Sue Stewart Smith's book is all about the mind and the garden connection. And part of that is spiritual. Um, and I think, you know, there's a connection that we have to the earth and using seeds or working with seeds, growing plants from seeds really strengthens that. And um, maybe a connection to beyond the earth even. So seeds are really wonderful and magical. And I think they've captivated people's attention for certainly millennia because of their power to germinate and grow and renew life. So there's my philosophical, philosophical part of my program. So with seeds, you can grow proven favorites, the plants you really like to have in your garden. You can try out new and unusual plants. And at the end of this program, I'm gonna talk about five or six unusual annuals I really like that I've grown in the past. I'll show you some pictures of those, which are kind of fun. And then you're not gonna find those at most nurseries or garden centers. You can grow things you really desire. And this picture of a orange zinnia, uh, I took from my garden last year. For some reason, last spring, I had this real desire to grow orange zinnias. And I'm not quite sure why, but I got orange zinnia seed and I grew this little patch of orange zinnias. And for some reason, those orange zinnias gave me more pleasure than a lot of the other parts of my garden last summer. I just loved that orange color. It seemed so happy and vibrant, and uh, it was a really wonderful tonic to the mind. Um, if you are of the organic bet pension, you can make sure your plants are truly organic by growing them yourself. And there's my orange zinnia. You can grow a wider range of plants than you can find uh, for sale locally. Uh, that picture of the blue flower there, which is an incredible structure really, is from our unusual annuals project. It's called Nigella. And that's not something you're probably going to find in a garden center, but you can easily grow it from seed. And then the pictures of the tomatoes come from 2019, certainly happier days in the past. We had 63 tomatoes that we offered to the public for tasting one evening in August at the demonstration garden. And a lot of those were grown from seed by master gardeners, varieties you would not find at a local garden center uh, for the most part. So we had all sorts of crazy and wonderful tomato varieties there. And it was a lot of fun to do that. Uh, you can grow extra plants to pass along to friends, to uh, swap, to bring to a plant sale. Uh, seeding, starting with seeds is cheaper than starting uh, with plants. And this is a picture here on the left of our unusual annuals project from way, way back. I think it was 2004, 2005. We grew a lot of annuals at the demonstration garden. And um, it was a lot of fun because with seeds, you can grow a great quantity of plants and have a really knock your socks off display for not that much money. And the plants in the container 
That's one of my container gardens. I wouldn't say it's the most beautiful container garden planting I've ever done, but those were all grown from seed. So literally that cost me pennies to put that container planting together. Okay, uh, seed libraries, a form of community building. There's a movement nowadays to uh, collect seeds and swap seeds, uh, these little lending libraries for books. Once in a while you see them done for seeds, like in that first picture on the left. The filing cabinet comes from, I believe, the library in Voorheesville, which has a seed uh, bank or a seed library there that during normal times, I think you can go and trade seeds or get seeds from the library. I don't know if that's happening. You might want to call the Voorheesville Library. And I, there's a few other libraries in the area that do that, I believe. And the picture of the black mailbox is from my garage because we're going to have a black mailbox full of seeds for free set up in front of the Cooperative Extension Office in Troy because we were gifted from one of the box stores of a huge quantity of leftover seeds from last year. So we're going to put those in the mailbox and put a sign on it say, come take the free seeds and see if we can get people excited about growing seeds. So when we set that mailbox up and put the seeds out, I will let you all know by an email. Certainly winter is the time to navigate or investigate, I should say, the seed catalogs and the website. So there's a picture not looking too much different than today on our tomato cages. And it's a great time to look at seed catalogs. The old way to do it or certainly to go online and find all sorts of wonderful things. It's also a great time of the year to mess about with things. Uh, we have a lot of slow days, a lot of snowy days. And normally I would be uh, out puttering around in my greenhouse, getting that cleaned up if I was going to indeed start a lot of seeds in my greenhouse, which some years I do and some years I don't. But it's also just a great time of the year to start doing this indoors too. And that's really why I wanted to talk about this today to get people started and give them an early start. So with seeds, it's always a question of do we sow this seed inside or sow it outside? So we might sow uh, plants which develop slowly or need special coddling or need warm soils to germinate or resent unsettled spring weather, we might sow those all inside, the seeds that need a little extra attention. But plants that don't like to be transplanted or that grow quickly or that you want to grow a lot of, uh, like corn, you know, things like that, you would certainly sow outside. And, uh, you know, if you're going to think about this, you can always come up with lists from maybe the internet. I just wrote a little list out here, indoors, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, eggplant, kale, leek, onion, pepper, and tomato, certainly. And outdoors, things like cucumber, lettuce, melon, parsley, squash. Um, or that was indoors or outdoors, I should say. And certainly outdoors would be things that, you know, really are very easy to grow or maybe don't like to be moved. Certainly beans come up quickly, beets, carrots. You can't really transplant root crops that well. And then things like uh, radishes, again, same thing, rutabaga or spinach is easy to grow, sweet corn you grow a lot of, and turnips are a root crop. So you probably wouldn't start those inside. And really these same ideas apply to flowering plants as well. You know, sunflowers, easy to grow outside. But a lot of the other flowers maybe that take a little special coddling, you might start those inside. So there is a little bit of wisdom or experience maybe needed here or, or reading up perhaps when you want to start your seeds and that's a good time, you know, now is a good time to start thinking about that. And I just need to pick, uh, throw up a picture of seed germination here. Um, this is a bean plant. It's a dicot because it has two cotyledons. And those cotyledons you can see are indicated on there. Those are the first true seed leaves or the first uh, sort of primordial leaves. And then we have another set of what we call true leaves that develop later on. But um, this is just how seeds grow. I thought I would give you a picture of that to, to know what to look for. And certainly a monocot is going to just have one cotyledon and a one seed leaf or one true leaf, I should say, as it starts to grow. Okay, getting started. I made some factors important in seed germination here. I, this is kind of how I organized this talk today. And I thought about what you really need to do in order to get started with your seed. So first off, you might think about your setup. Okay, I didn't really have a better word for it than setup. How are you going to do this and what part of your house are you going to take over? 
to do this in, unless you have a greenhouse and you're really lucky, maybe you need to dedicate some space in a dining room or in a bedroom or the basement, someplace like that, and kind of get started. Certainly the timing is really important with starting seeds. Uh, the media or the soil, it's really not soil, so we like to call it media or soilless mix usually. Uh, what are you gonna grow these plants in? What's gonna be their root system uh, container? Uh, moisture, we'll talk about that very briefly. The temperature of the air and of the media is important and light. And there's a few other factors too sprinkled in. So maybe I should be embarrassed to show you this, but I put this picture in here anyway, because I thought it was kind of funny. Here's my potential setup area. How could possibly gr be growing, uh, how could I possibly grow seeds in this kind of messy room that I have? This is my room upstairs in the house that I kind of do a lot of stuff in. Crafts, I have books in there, computers, exercise bike, all sorts of stuff all over the place. And it's really not a great place to start seeds. Uh, you do need sort of a dedicated place, a place you're not going to knock them over, a place that's not going to be in the traffic pattern of people or pets. And my messy man cave is not the best place to do it in, unless I really cleaned it up. So that's one of the challenges, I think, sometimes is where do you really do this? Do you take over the dining room table? Do you do it on the kitchen counter? Uh, it's a little bit tricky sometimes. Uh, this is a picture of my greenhouse uh, in full production here. And certainly if you are lucky to have a home greenhouse, you probably know how to use it uh, by this point, but it is a wonderful environment for growing seeds because you have plenty of light. Uh, you do need to heat it. And really that's one of the challenges of a greenhouse. Um, and you do need to cool it. In fact, the door there is open because a picture like this, this was probably well into April or May. This was, uh, yeah, probably the end of April, I would guess, because the plants are pretty big there. Uh, it does get very hot. And one other thing I'll say about this picture, too, is down in the left-hand corner, there's a fan. And even if you're starting seeds in, indoors in the house, it's sometimes a good idea to have a fan nearby and move the air around because air movement will jostle the plants and make them sturdier, as well as probably reduce moisture and maybe reduce the incidence of something like uh, dampening off or fungus gnats. But we're not always all fortunate to have a greenhouse. And quite honestly, running the greenhouse and heating the greenhouse is very expensive. So I don't really do this as much as I used to do every year. I tend to start some seeds indoors and then move them out into the greenhouse and not really heat the greenhouse like I used to. So if we don't have a greenhouse, what can we do with what we have? And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. So first off, I think time is really important to discuss for a second. Uh, because timing of growing the seeds is going to be important in that we don't want to start too early and have plants that really need to go outside or want to go outside when it's still, um, you know, unsettled weather and still too chilly for them. And we also want to start in time. We don't really want to be thinking about growing seeds that take a while to develop, you know, on May 1st. That's a little too late, perhaps. So we look at our seed packet and some seed packets are really great because they give us some instructions. And here's a Ferry Moore seed packet. It says for earliest bloom, start seed on a sunny windowsill six to eight weeks before transplanting outdoors, or these may be seeded directly outdoors. So you've got some options here. Uh, this is balsam, which is similar to impatience. It's in the same uh, family. And um, I've grown these in the greenhouse or in my basement too under lights. And I think they do a little bit better with a head start. So six to eight weeks, um, what does that really mean? That's something to think about. So when do we start seed? We read the seed packet and we start to count backwards. So if I wanted to plant these out, say May 15th, um, I would count backwards six to eight weeks. Well, eight weeks would be two months, so that would be March, the middle of March. Or if I wanted to plant these out uh, at the end of May, I might start these at the end of what? End of March. So you've really just got to do a little math there and think about, um, you know, time and uh, really when you want these to be ready to go. So not too early. And I, when I grew a lot in the greenhouse, I would start up really 
in mid-March for the most part. And that was partly because I didn't want to heat the greenhouse any earlier than I had to. Uh, but mid-March really tended to work out pretty well for things like tomatoes and peppers and those kind of plants. Okay, so that's timing. Then a big question I think people have is the growing media. What do we start our seeds in? Well, in theory, a go good growing media will offer moisture retention. We want this media to have uh, the ability to hold moisture. Something very sandy, of course, wouldn't really hold a lot of moisture, so that wouldn't be a very good thing to start seeds in. We want it to have some air space because the seed itself, as well as the roots of the developing plant, are going to respire and they need oxygen, so we don't want it to be a very dense, heavy material. Um, a lot of potting mixes tend to be fairly heavy. If I was just to go to a store and buy what would be called potting mix, it might be very too heavy to really start seeds in. It might be good for a mature or established kind of house plant, but it might not be very good for uh, my seedlings. We probably wanted to have some nutrients. Now, you can add nutrients to potting media. That's not a big deal. Um, some seed starting mixes will have nutrients in. Um, made for, by the manufacturer. So you want to take a look at the label for that. And we just want to have a good place to grow roots. And a big one, of course, is really we want to have no pathogens. And this really is important with seeds. Seeds are delicate items. They're little babies, of, if you will, of the horticultural world. So they're very uh, susceptible to a disease called dampening off, which is caused by a number of different fungi. So we really want to keep a virtually sterile environment. Now that means the, the media really can't have pathogens in it. So that uh, makes it a little bit more important that we pay attention to the media. And most of the soilless media um, is going to be made from peat moss, vermiculite, perlite, shredded coconut, which is called core, rice hulls, composted bark, or other composted material. So that's the kind of stuff you're going to see in these mixes. Uh, here's some nice pictures I stole off the internet on the left-hand side there are the organic components, things like uh, bark, sphagnum moss, and core. And on the right-hand side, it's going to be the inorganic components, the vermiculite, perlite, and the rice holes. And these two groups of components do sort of different things. The organic components, the brown ones, tend to be the things that hold the moisture and the inorganic components tend to be the bigger particles that allow for the air space. So you've got to have a combination of these different factors together. And there's been a lot of science and research on these kind of uh, mixes. Uh, Cornell, believe it or not, was one of the early uh, places that did a lot of this research on these, what, what became known as soilless mixes, because there's no soil from the ground or from a garden bed in these mixes. It's all these different uh, components put together. And it took quite a while and number of years to develop these and certainly people have their own favorite mixes for different plants. So how do I do it? Well, I'm kind of very <laughs> lazy gardener, I guess. I usually go to a store and buy a seed starting mix. Um, when I was growing a lot of flats in the greenhouse, I would go over to a place called Griffin Greenhouse Supply in Schenectady and they'll deal with people like me that would grow Back when I had the greenhouse really growing, uh, I would grow a lot of tomato plants and sell them um, of different varieties, and I would grow maybe 50, 55 flats. So I would go over and buy about mm, 10 of these big bags, maybe 10 or 11 or 12 of these 2.8 cubic uh, foot bags of seed starting mix. And this is the mix I use. It really, to me, works good, uh, well enough for my purposes, certainly and it was easy. I didn't have to mix my own materials together. I could just buy this and be assured that it was a good quality product. So it was easy to use, consistent, and I had um, good results every time I really use this. So I'm not a person that really likes to fuss with making a mix. Some people do like to make their own mix, and that's wonderful if you like to do that. Um, but I don't, I don't know that it's uh, entirely necessary. Okay. So let's see, there we go. Uh, this is just a couple of pictures I took of what that Fafford mix looks like. Um, the label tells us it's 55% Canadian sphagnum peat with some perlite and vermiculite in it. Now I know people 
uh, do have some concerns about peat. It is a renewable resource, but I read recently it takes 250,000 years to renew. So should we be using this as much? And that's where you get some of the mixes now with core, that C-O-I-R material uh, that has, uh, it's a product of the coconut industry. We've used that a little bit for a couple different projects with the master gardeners and it has worked pretty well. So in the future, I might think about using a mix like that. Uh, but there are lots of different mixes out there at different retailers and you can find them as Richard Demick told us earlier, even at Walmart, they have seed starting mix. So um, probably not something that's too difficult to find these days, I hope. And I would look for one that was definitely specifically for starting seeds. And again, I would avoid potting soil uh, for this kind of step, unless you wanted to lighten the potting soil up yourself by adding something to it. Um, that's certainly possible too. So we do have to talk about one kind of sad a little bit of information here, dampening off disease. And here's a picture I stole off the internet of that. You can see these little tomato seedlings falling over. And if you look very carefully, they're the bottom of the stem, the area where the stem is entering the soil into the uh, media, really, I should say, to, to make the root system, has shriveled and has died. And there's a number of fungi, uh, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Fusarium species that can attack these young seedlings. And this is a very common thing to have happen. Uh, these diseases can be in the growing media or in the containers. Uh, they can come from contaminated tools, hands, or fungus gnats. So that is really why we do make some effort to use a sterile uh, growing medium. And sterile is something I put in quotes there because nothing is really entirely sterile. But if we buy a bag of seed starting mix, they probably, and it's a good quality mix, they have really taken uh, steps to make sure that we don't have pathogens in that. New containers are gonna probably be okay to use but if we wanna reuse our containers, we're gonna to have to clean them thoroughly. And we don't really wanna reuse any growing medium. And we don't really wanna use a bag that's been sitting there open for a while because certainly fungi could have contaminated that over time. And we don't really wanna overwater our seedlings. Soggy media is gonna maybe um, produce more of a problem as well. So we don't wanna overwater. Um, what if we wanna uh, clean our old containers. Well, we can do that. Now these are cells or what I call cells. Some people will call these modules, uh, plastic containers, what have you. Um, if you want to reuse those, what you should do is knock off all the loose material, clean them with soapy, soap and water, and then soak them in a mix of one part bleach to nine parts water uh, for about 30 minutes. That's one of the classic recommendations of cleaning um, things like containers for use in seed starting. Um, some people will spray this with a hydrogen peroxide and wait 30 minutes. That might be a, actually a little easier to do. Um, some variation of using bleach or some kind of a cleaning agent here is important. So uh, you do wanna do that if you're gonna reuse any of these containers. And of course, what if we wanna create our own sterile media? Well, this is a challenge, but we can do that as well. We can do something called pasteurization. You might remember Louis Pasteur, um, who worked with milk and uh, foodstuffs and figured out how to keep them from spoiling quite as quickly as they might otherwise do. Well, pasteurization is heating for a period of time. It's not killing everything in whatever you're heating, but you're going to reduce a lot of the toxic compounds or the potential um, sources of those. So if we wanted to, we could heat our media in an oven for 140 degrees for about 30 minutes. We might using a roast, use a roasting pan. We might set the oven at 300, heat it up um, and have it in there for quite a while. Watch maybe with a soil thermometer and see how it works. I have done that in my own oven at home and people will say, yeah, it really doesn't smell good. And they write, <laughs> it sometimes doesn't smell too good. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of work. So, again, I would probably be more likely to recommend going to and buying a seed starting mix that's already taken care of. You can also do this in a microwave. I haven't done that, but there are instructions around for that. And we would want to check it with a thermometer to see that we're 
getting to our appropriate temperatures. Uh, don't do this if your spouse is home. Maybe during a pandemic, this is not really good to do when people are around more. If they all go out to work for the day, maybe you can do this. And certainly don't reuse vessels in your kitchen. I wouldn't recommend, you know, using your meatloaf tray or your wok or something like that. It's not really a great thing to be doing. Okay, so why isn't garden soil a great growing medium for seeds? Well, we've kind of alluded to this. It's too heavy. Um, while it's okay in the ground for growing plants, a lot of these soils tend to have um, clay in them. They don't have a good air space when we put them in a pot and they're too heavy. They're going to retain too much moisture and I'm sure that there's going to be pathogens in soils that will come out and express themselves when we're starting seeds in a house, whereas outside there might not be a problem with them. Um, another little piece of wisdom that I was taught when I went through uh, and worked at different public gardens way back in the early days was when you're potting things up, especially seedlings, you, it's good to fill the container to the top. And the picture on the left-hand side shows our little containers kind of low. And that is not so good because air movement isn't great across the surface of the media there. It's better to have that media up to the top so that if we have air movement, it's going to reduce the chances of disease and um, reduce problems. So professional growers will often fill these cells or pots or whatever they're using up to the top uh, before they plant the seeds. So then, you know, we filled our containers with media. Do we cover our seeds or not? Well, again, hopefully our seed packet is going to give us some advice. And here this burpee packet says we're going to uh, cover these seeds to a depth of a quarter inch. So that's really wonderful. Um, I would say, you know, if your seed packet isn't really telling you to cover your seeds or not, I would go to uh, a source and look it up. I have a book by Ken Drews, and I forgot to put a picture of it in here. It's Ken Drews's uh, plant propagation book. It's uh, D-R-U-S-E, Ken Drews. And he gives advice on, you know, which seeds to cover and which seeds not to cover. Some seeds need light to germinate, so we don't want to cover those. Other seeds need dark to germinate, so we do want to cover those. Um, something else, other, uh, some people will use to cover seeds is chicken grit. Um, this will also be a good way to reduce the incidence of disease. I've only used chicken grit a few times, um, but some people swear by it, so I, I put that in here today. Then we need to think about our containers. Of course, we've I'm kind of progressing here is that we filled our containers and we planted our seeds, but uh, before that, we really have to have the container, don't we? Uh, a container really shouldn't be too large. It's got to allow for drainage. So if we're going to reuse any kind of containers and recycle things, we want to drain, uh, drill holes in them. Um, and you can start seeds in a large size container and then transplant each seedling into its own container. And that's called kind of a communal uh, setup where we grow a lot of seeds in maybe a flat, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Or we might plant one or two seeds in each of those cells like I showed you, and then grow them plants on from there. And the picture here I've stolen uh, shows kind of the first situation where we're growing a lot of seeds communally, and then we're gonna have to lift those seeds out and separate those seedlings and plant them on in cells and grow them up. So there's gonna be a little futzing here at this stage. Um, which is totally normal for growing seeds. Now, again, I'm lazy. I kind of show you how I do it. I get these six pack cells. These are fairly large ones. They come in different sizes. Um, my setup is that I use a solid no hole tray. That's the picture on the left hand side there. And I put my cells in that tray. I fill them all with media at one time. I tamp them down slightly to compact it. Then I put water in the tray and I let that media soak up the water and then sit for a few days. Of course, I drain out the excess water and I have these trays ready to go. That's kind of how I used to grow 50 and 55 flats of tomatoes kind of in a production way. And I sort of liked it that way. I like having the solid tray. I like having those cells to drain down and I would put three or four tomato seeds in each of those cells and see how many germinated. I would take, you know, the extras out and grow one tomato plant on in each cell and, and sort of do it that way. But your system has to evolve in how you want to 
do it and what equipment you have to do. That's just the way I happen to do it. Certainly a lot of people start seeds in non, what I call non-professional containers, things out of the recycling bin. I picked this out of the recycling bin a couple weeks ago and I thought, gee, this would make a nice little container to start some seeds in. It's about two and a quarter inches deep, which is just about perfect depth, I think. But I would definitely want to drill some drainage holes in this because I wouldn't want to start seeds in something that didn't drain well. So do check your yogurt containers or whatever you're going to use if you're going to recycle things, which is perfectly fine to do. You know, maybe you don't want to invest in all that plastic. And I certainly understand not wanting to add more plastic to the world. There are alternatives. And some of my master gardeners uh, have gotten good at using some of these. I know some folks use these paper pots. You buy one of these little uh, circular discs of wood that kind of allows you to wrap some newspaper around it and make fashion this little paper pot. Of course, nowadays, who reads newspaper? So maybe that's a little more difficult than it used to be. And soil blocks, there's a little gizmo there that you can um, use to block um, soil or media, I should say, and make your own blocks. And some people end up liking that system. I'm not quite sure how easy that is to use, but some people certainly make that work for themselves. And there's also biodegradable pots. I've only used these a few times, I think. These are made from wood fiber peat. Uh, you're not using plastic. Uh, some folks like these for plants which don't like their roots to be disturbed, like cucurbits. I've read that people like growing cucurbits and they have success with them in these sort of biodegradable pots. Um, I think these tend to be a little bit more expensive and do they decompose quickly enough? I uh, have read stories about them not really breaking down. So when you plant these, uh, when you plant your seedling from uh, bring it outside, put it in the garden with one of these, you want to probably rough this um, little biodegradable pot up. You might rip the bottom off of it before you plant it. Um, and it also might wick away some moisture if you leave it sticking up above the soil. So do be a little careful with those. I think they could certainly work well though. Okay, and here's just what I was talking about before, the communal tray on the left-hand side there. You'd wanna make sure that had some holes in it if you were grow, uh, using that to start your seeds in or your cells or your modules on the right-hand side. And I guess I alluded to this already. Uh, these mixes tend to be very dry out of the bag. So usually I would fill this flat up just like in that picture there. I would add some water in the bottom of that tray, let it sit for several hours or maybe overnight, soak up the, the moisture, drain off the excess and make sure I had that medium really well watered before I actually planted my seeds. And certainly moisture and watering seedlings is gonna be a little tricky. You don't really wanna keep these soaking wet, yet you can't really let them dry out. And that's one of the hardest things to tell people or uh, people that are new to this sort of thing. How do you do this? Well, you know, soaking wet, I think is obvious. Too dry is obvious too. You really gotta keep an eye on these kind of things because the seeds can rot if the soil is cold and soggy. And I like to really water from the bottom. So let's say this plant, this tray here was planted up with tomato seeds. And about 10 days later, uh, I started to get some nice seedlings in there and they needed a little water. I would take one of these six packs out of water from the bottom. I don't really like to water from the top. Watering from the bottom doesn't disturb the media and the seedlings tend to uh, sort of just be fine by um, having that, that moisture come up from the bottom. Okay, air movement, I alluded to this before. In the greenhouse, I used to use a fan to move the air around. And you can also do that in, in you know, your seed area. Maybe you've got um, a place in a basement and there's not a lot of good air circulation. So adding a fan might help move the air around a little bit. It will reduce moisture. It may shake the seedlings, which also makes them stronger. Um, one of the cures, which you'll kind of show at the end, if your seedlings are growing too fast, put a fan on and make them move and jiggle and they'll actually grow stronger stems and uh, stop their elongation uh, quite as quickly. Uh, we should mention temperature. Of course, temperature is really important because seeds need a certain temperature in order to start to grow. Uh, and the air and the media temperature are both important. 
Most seed seeds are going to do fine at 70 degrees or so. Some like a little bit warmer than that, 75. Uh, some even like a little bit less, 65. So if you're growing them in a house and you're not a person that heats your house very well, like me, my house is 60 degrees during the day. It's kind of chilly. Uh, for my seeds, I might want to raise that up and uh, give them a little more war warmth. Uh, but, you know, again, check your seed packet or books for some guidance. And also, I'd like to mention bottom heat. This is a great uh, thing if you have one and you might want to invest in one of these. This is a rubber mat with uh, electric or I should say probably copper cables in it. And that mat, once plugged in, will heat up and raise the temperature of your media. So you put your, this mat uh, is kind of an old one. It's got sort of a wire grid out over it. You put your flat or your pots or whatever on top of that wire grid and that heat comes up and really gives you some nice heat in the media. You can use a soil thermometer or I, I call it a soil thermometer. It's actually a kitchen thermometer, a meat thermometer uh, to see what your soil temperature is. And these mats are said to raise the temperature about 10 degrees. So I've really experienced when I use the mat, I do get better germination. It's worth while having one of these, especially if you have certain seeds that maybe your packet or your books are going to tell you like a little bit warmer soil to germinate. So there's the old mat outside. Now that has gotten dirty over time, so I should scrub that off and I'd probably use the bleach uh, solution on that. Even though it's not going to come in direct contact with my soil media or my media, I should say, um, I'd like to clean that pretty well because that's gotten kind of dirty over time. Now, if you don't want to invest in a heat mat, there are other ways to do this. I've known people that have put their seeds on top of the refrigerator because the refrigerator has a hot spot or a warm spot on top of it. And you can see there's a picture of the top of my refrigerator. I have phone books there. When was the last time I used a phone book? I could throw those out or recycle those certainly. And I'd have a little bit of space there, but my cabinet comes down too low. So that's not really great. But the other picture is my furnace, and my furnace has a warm spot on top. And believe it or not, I have used that warm spot to germinate seeds on, and it really is a great thing. Now, seeds don't necessarily need light, or some seeds don't need light, and the basement's going to be kind of dark. So I would put the seed tray on that, check it every day, see what uh, comes up, and certainly when they start to germinate, move them to the light. But that little bit of warmth there is a little bit of free heat, which is a good thing, and gives me a little advantage. Now let's kind of get uh, towards the uh, final part of their setup, I guess we could say, and talk about light. Now light's going to be, of course, very important because these little baby seedlings really are going to need light. Some seeds need light to germinate, some seeds need dark, as we said before, um, but your seedlings are really going to need as much light as you give them. And this is really one of the factors that's limiting, I think, in people's success because they get the seed to germinate, but then they have trouble providing enough light for the seeds. So here's a picture of the window I'm actually looking at right now as I'm talking to you and my garden out there. And does that window really give us enough light for seedlings? Well, unfortunately, this house doesn't have really great light in it from any window. That window faces east, but with clouds and not really uh, full sun even because there's too many trees out there, my window sills are not really great to start seed. Now, some people are blessed with a house that has a lot of south-facing windows and a good amount of light coming in. You probably can use your window sills to start seeds, but my house is really not set up for that. And seedlings get wimpy and they stretch when they don't have enough light. Here's another picture stolen from the internet. And these poor seedlings have germinated. They're coming up rapidly and you can see they're kind of all over the place. They're falling over because they don't have enough light. And that's what happens oftentimes with windowsills. Another photograph stolen from the internet here and somebody's growing tomato plants in plastic cups, which is certainly fine as long as you give your cup a hole and it has some drainage. I would have filled them up a little higher. I think the cup uh, is a little low there on the level of the media. And also these plants are, 
they're probably going to be okay, but they're kind of getting stretched and they're kind of getting wimpy. Now, luckily with tomato plants, you can, of course, plant them lower. When we transplant these tomato plants, we can plant them lower in the ground and they'll be just fine because they can develop roots along their stems. So you can kind of get away with having some wimpy tomato plants, but almost any other seedling is not going to do quite as well. So they're going to need a little bit more light than we can provide there. So how do we do that? Well, the good old artificial lights, right? There's many fancy growing system or many fancy lighting systems and growing systems on the market, but you can also rig together something with shop lights. And I guess I probably learned about this when I was a teenager, we had shop lights and I learned about this probably from Cooperative Extension and I got a shop light and started growing seedlings under that. And I just mean a four foot fluorescent light fixture, very common. Um, you would put this in your workshop. You might use this in a laundry room or some other kind of utility space in your house. Now, luckily seedlings aren't too fussy about the color spectrum of light that's provided. And um, you know, this is a very low cost and cheap way to go. You probably wanna run these a fair amount of the time. Most people will say 14, 16, 18 hours a day to give your seedlings a lot of light. Um, you can put them on a timer and they work pretty well. So just a minute on these bulbs. Now I thought, you know, I've learned about this 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. What's new in lighting? Well, certainly things have changed. Um, even years ago, we didn't really use incandescent bulbs because they were too hot and inefficient. So we skipped that, but back in my early start, seed starting days, of course, the fluorescents were the big thing. And we have mostly cool fluorescent bulbs that are common. This gives off sort of a blue light. This is the one you'll probably find in the store and they're certainly fine to use. Um, there's also warm fluorescent bulbs. You can add one, you can have a cool bulb and a warm bulb, but you could probably get away with either two cool bulbs or two warm bulbs just as well. Um, nowadays, of course, newer ones, you see the picture there, we have compact fluorescents. If you have sort of a lamp fixture, what you wanna use instead of that um, long four foot bulb, you can try to do something like that because that floor, fluorescent compact bulb will also work well. And even back in my day, they had grow bulbs. So I have a few of those around, you know, even they've got to be 30 years old and they still work. They're not as efficient because they do lose efficiency over time. And the grow bulbs will have both blue and red light. Uh, of course, what's new are LEDs and they do make LED tubes that are four feet long. They will go into a similar um, housing as those old shop lights. They'll be more efficient, they'll be lo very long-lived bulbs, and LEDs are fine to grow plants under. That was something I really had to learn uh, and update myself on. You can grow seedlings under LD LED lights and they're perfectly fine. Uh, here's just an old chart about the fluorescence. The T12 fluorescent bulb is kind of the old one we've used for years. The T8 works just as well. It's a little more efficient. It's a smaller diameter bulb, and uh, that might be something you'll see in stores as well. So either one, fluorescent or LED works fine. And here I just put this picture in because they're growing flowering plants under their artificial lights. Now, if we were gonna grow flowering plants, we would want the full color spectrum. We would want blue as well as red light. So we would have to be fussier about our bulbs or our tubes, I should say. Um, but we're not really fussy because seedlings don't flower. They're gonna flower much later and we're not worried about the flowering. So just good old shop lights are gonna be good enough for our purposes. Now you can get very fancy, go on the internet, find these wonderful growing systems. Here's one, $479, it's a little bit of money, but you could grow some very nice seedlings on a system like that. It has four LED tubes and it's gonna be very uh, energy efficient. So you can get very high tech, you can get very uh, current and very efficient, or you can kind of do it David's way. I have, here's a shop light I have upstairs over my exercise bike, and that's just what, about what I would use. There's a lot of great videos about this. Uh, here's a whole um, explanation from the University of Maryland Cooperative Extension. I'll let you look that up yourself. They've made a little stand here out of PVC pipe. Um, they'll tell you how much it costs to run this 
uh, light for, oh, March 15th to June 1st, only $9. So it's really not a lot of money to set up something like this or to run something like this. So that one comes from the University of Maryland Extension. It's a great little uh, website there and lots of information about running it and making it. This is another one from Kansas and she's got a video here. You go to K-State, easy to make grow light and you can learn all about that. So I'll leave you with that. If you're interested in setting up a light, that's the way to go. Uh, here's the setup I have down in my basement. This is set up for doing crafts under it uh, on a table. When I wanna grow seedlings, I move that light down um, and get it a lot closer. And this was just one I had to show you because I thought this picture was wonderful. Again, I stole this off the internet and we have some good and not so good things happening here. Isn't this great? This is somebody's home unit. They've built these wonderful wooden uh, stands here. They've got their grow lights going. They've got their soil blocker up on the top shelf there. They've got a fan to move the air around. They've got really a lot going on here that's positive. Their seedlings look pretty good, they're a little leggy, but they're doing okay. Um, the dog, he's behaving, he's not knocking things over. I just kind of worry about all those electrical cords there. We don't want to create a fire hazard, so we should say, be careful with your electrical cords. I have known two people that caused house fires when they were starting seeds, and I didn't really want to tell you those stories because I don't want to discourage anybody, but do be careful with electrical power cords and starting seeds. Um, and just a timer, uh, be, because that makes life easier to put your um, lights on a timer. And this is just a little bit better picture of my basement setup. There's my um, seed mat or my heat mat, I guess I should say, um, on its wire rack, and then my flat underneath for, uh, the light. So the light is kind of high there still when the seedlings start to germinate, the light would be lowered. And the light should probably be about two, three, four inches from those, uh, from the bot, from the, the flat there, really almost on top of the seedlings. Okay, make sure you label everything. That certainly goes um, without saying, I think, because there's nothing worse than having a bunch of seedlings without labels and you don't know what you're doing, right? How about fertilizer? Um, read your seed starting bag carefully. See if it has any star, uh, fertilizer in it. And if not, once your seedlings start to grow and really get their first true leaves on them, meaning like in that picture there, the last or biggest seedling, they have their true leaves starting to develop. You wanna give your seedlings a diluted fertilizer. That could be fish emulsion or some organic type of fertilizer, or it could be something like miracle Grow diluted down probably by at least half Seedlings don't need strong fertilizer, but they do need a little bit of fertilizer. And here's a picture I made years ago of two of my tomato seedlings. I let one um, have as much fertilizer as it would like, and that's the nice dark green one on the right-hand side. And then I starved one of my tomato seedlings on purpose to make this picture there and show you that that plant is starving. It's got a yellow cast to the leaves, a purplish cast as well. It needs nitrogen, it needs phosphorus, it needs potassium. So you do wanna give your seedlings a little fertilizer as they get going. And if you're gonna use that communal tray, uh, you do wanna separate those out and put them in cells like we have here. And that method or that step is called pricking off, which is a little bit of a crazy term, but that's an old horticultural saying, and here you, they've got a spoon or something like a knife that they're using to lift those seedlings. And you really have to be careful here. You wanna keep the root, uh, as much of the root as possible. You wanna keep it intact. You don't wanna tear the leaves. It does take a little bit of work and effort, but there are um, you know, certainly uh, ways you can do that successfully using a little sharp label or a spoon or some other um, tool of choice. Okay. How big or how can I slow down seedlings that are getting too big too fast? It's hard to put brakes on these species, okay? If your seedlings are growing too fast, let's say it's only April 15th and your seedlings are big and you've got another, you know, at least three weeks of weather that might not be so good. Well, you can try to water them less, reduce the moisture, reduce the fertilizer, but I wouldn't starve them completely. We don't want them to turn as yellow as that tomato seedling. 
We want to give them as much light as possible because that will reduce the stretching. And professional growers will use something called diff, which I don't have really time to get into, but if we keep the nighttime temperature and the daytime temperature in the environment, as even as possible, the seedlings will stretch less. You can touch them or shake them or put a fan um, on them. Tomato seedlings, when I grew a lot of them, I would take a stick, like a yardstick, and touch them several times a day and shake them. And that made them sturdier and that will slow down their stretching. And we can move them outdoors as soon as possible. And we can start our seeds a little bit later. So this is kind of a funny odd picture here because there's not much going on. This is the back of my garage, but this is my seedling hardening off area. And late April, I put my seedlings out here sometimes for the day and they come in at night. Sometimes they stay out overnight, but when the weather starts to warm up and the days are getting longer and not having really violent weather like wind, it's safe to put your seedlings out and you wanna do uh, an area like this that's partly sheltered, not in full sun, to harden off your seedlings. And that's, again, another old horticultural term is hardening off. It just means we're transitioning these plants gently from inside to outside. We're not gonna rush out and put, plant them immediately out in the full sunshine. We're gonna do this for a couple weeks and slowly get them used to life outdoors. It's just like, um, introducing a puppy, you know, to the world. You're, you're, you've got this impressionable little creature. You're taking him out a little bit every day and getting him used to being outside and running with the big dogs. So in summary, if you want a good fact sheet, uh, University of New Hampshire, UNH Extension, you can Google that and there's a great fact sheet called Starting Plants Indoors from Seed, which will give you lots of good details. Okay. So that's the bulk of the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box. I promise we'll be done in two minutes maybe. <laughs> I just wanted to show you a, a couple plants I really like that I grow from seed and get you inspired maybe to try some new things from seed. Um, we tend to plant the same things over and over sometimes. But back in uh, 2004, 2005, I was growing a lot of things in my greenhouse and. I wanted to grow a lot of different unusual annuals and we planted these for two years, I think, at the demonstration garden at the Robert C. Parker School in North Greenbush. And we had this huge annual garden. And these are some of the plants I grew back then uh, from seed. So I just wanted to show you a couple of these. My favorites, and I'm gonna try to grow a few of these again this year. This is called Abel Motius Sunset or Sunset uh, Okra. It's a flowering okra relative. It's a really great plant, grows four to seven feet tall, has a big, very pale yellow flower on it and sort of palm foliage or palm shaped, palm like the shape of your hand foliage, I should say. It's very striking and you're not gonna find this in a garden center, I don't believe, um, but it's a very beautiful plant. And this can be found in seed catalogs and grows fairly easily from seed. So it's just kind of a cool thing, something your neighbors aren't gonna have. Um, it's an old heirloom variety, comes from an 1894 seed catalog, but you just don't see it grown very much. Um, a plant we alluded to, the impatience uh, or balsam impatience. This is a great plant. This used to be one of the most uh, popular bedding plants many years ago, but it kind of fell out of favor and people grew uh, the bedding plant impatience or now the New Guinea impatience more, you just don't see this one. But I grew this from seed a few times. It's really a cool plant. The flowers are a little more hidden in the foliage, um, but it, it'll take full sun. It's an easy grower, comes in a wide variety of different colors, pink, red, and white, uh, and violet. It's just kind of a cool thing. Um, and here's one called uh, blackberry trifle balsam. Uh, that was some seed I got that was just that sort of, uh, what would you call that, lilac color. Okay, I really like flowering tobacco. Tobacco, of course, is not something we talk about as a society anymore. It's this evil uh, thing smoking is looked down upon, but the plants are kind of cool. There was a guy named Jean Nicot, who was the French ambassador to the Portuguese court. He was an explorer. He found, or he claimed to have found, uh, quote unquote, these plants in the new world. 
brought them back to the old world, gave uh, these toba tobacco plants to Catherine de Medici, the queen, and she started smoking them to cure her migraines and her smoking became a new fad. And that became the use of tobacco as this horrible thing that we're trying to get people to not do anymore. So the plants themselves have sort of a bad reputation, but the flowers of the plants and the ornamental uh, Nicotianas or tobaccos are very, very pretty. This is one called lime green, very easy to grow from seed. It's about three feet tall. It'll self sow a little bit in your garden, but it will never become an invasive. And uh, the plant breeders have made shorter and bushier ones of this. Uh, I just think that's kind of a cool color because you could put that with blue or red or orange and it would be really quite outstanding looking. Uh, this is one called the Bella Nicotiana, <coughs> excuse me, kind of a different variety. This was pretty new a few years ago and I do still see it in seed catalogs. It's got white flowers that fade to pink and it's a very striking kind of architectural plant, about four feet tall, <coughs> excuse me, in my garden. My favorite one of the bunch is this one called the Woodland Tobacco or Star Flower. This is uh, Nicotiana Only the Lonely. They sell, sell it under that name. I'm not quite sure why, but it's got a big mop head of these giant uh, clusters of tubular flowers on top. You know, this is a real showstopper in July and August. This will be the centerpiece of your garden bed if you, if you grow some of these. It's got these big kind of clunky uh, tobacco leaves on it as well, which are kind of cool as well in their own right, but it's really a, a neat, neat plant and uh, just a very show-stopping kind of a thing. And then there's another variety called Langsdorfii, which is called lime tobacco. Uh, very small flower, but very unique kind of uh, look about it. It's got sort of a tubular shape. So there's lots of different Nicotianas that are a lot of fun. The purple teepee, uh, climbing beans, I grow these from seed. And I wouldn't probably start these in the uh, inside. I would probably direct sow these, but I just wanted to throw that picture in there because that's a great climbing plant that can be grown from seed. There's lots of Rebeccias, uh, these big daisy flowers. These are really great plants. You don't see these uh, sold in garden centers and you don't really see these grown in gardens very often. But annual Rebeccias, you know, we're all uh, familiar with Rebeccia, Goldsturm, or some of the perennial Rebeccias. But these annual ones like this Kelvin and Star, beautiful plant, grows easily from seed, two to three feet tall, real showstopper. Uh, this one's called Indian Summer, sort of a black-eyed Susan kind of uh, look to it, very pretty. And here's one called Prairie Sun. This was new a few years ago, very striking colors and very, very colorful and easy to grow. One of my favorites along with the zinnias is called Tithonia or the Mexican Sunflower. Very, very tall plant, about six feet tall, has an orange flower on it, very attractive to pollinators. So if you want to plant a bee garden or a butterfly garden and you don't have to have all natives, this would be a great plant to have. And it gets kind of big, kind of bold, maybe not for everybody, but it's really quite uh, lovely with its orange flowers. Uh, so Tithonia is, uh, Tithonius was a Trojan mortal, and that's the plant that's named after him. And I think this might be the last one. This is called Nigella <coughs> or uh, Love in a Mist or Devil in the Bush. Another one of my real favorites because of this blue color. This is more of a front of the border plant. It's got kind of very delicate foliage to it. Not something you'll find in garden centers, but it's easy to grow from seed. And just a really cool looking flower. So there's a whole world of these annuals uh, beyond just the things you can find in the garden center that are really fun. So I would encourage you to grow something new in 2021. And thank you for watching today. Uh, back when we did our annual, unusual annuals pro, uh, project, these were the four seed sources that we had. Fedco from Waterville, Maine, Select Seeds um, from over in Connecticut, Thompson and Morgan, which of course is an old standby, and Parks. Uh, I know that Select Seeds is still in business. I just got their catalog the other day. And they certainly have a lot of unusual plants. So um, those would be the places I would start to look. But you know, with the internet now, you can find things all over the place. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and see if there's any questions.